great. Great of these stories, isn't it, of um, God's power and at work and helping other people. That's what the whole thing is about, isn't it? We're looking at our theme of summer psalms, and we're in Psalm 3 this morning. Dave did a, a great job last week opening up um, the psalms to us, and we're going to continue in that this morning. This psalm is probably one of my favorite psalms. It's a psalm that's very precious to me because I called it my O Lord psalm. There's three O Lords in it, and it came to me as a a, a, a time of deep grief and loss in my life. This was a psalm that was very precious to me. And there's some times in your life when you just can cry, Oh Lord, that's the only prayer that you have, Oh Lord. Um, <clears throat> I read a funny story lately of a little girl who was being a bit disobedient and her mom said to her, Honey, if you keep disobeying me, you're going to have to live with the consequences and the wee girl began to cry. She says, Mommy, I don't want to live with the consequences. I want to live with you. Um, and it's a funny story, but it's true. We all live with the consequences. We live with the consequences of choices we've made and mistakes we've made. And sometimes we even live with the consequences of other people's mistakes um, or other people's actions. Somebody else does something. We'll have to deal with the repercussions of that and um, something sometimes that we have no control of. And those consequences aren't always what we'd like them to be. They mightn't be the best. And so if you've ever experienced loneliness or disappointment or failure because of poor choices you made or poor choices someone else made or something that happened to you that you've no control over at all, then this psalm is for you. Let's read it together. I'm reading it from the NIV here, and then I'm going to make some remarks on it from the New King James, all right? There's the first one. Oh, Lord, I have so many enemies. So many people are against me. So many people are saying God will never rescue him, Selah. There's discrepancy over what the word Selah means, but the general consensus over the years, it means pause. It means step back a moment and just think about that. Um, and then he goes on to a second one. He says, but you, O Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. I cried out to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy mountain, Selah. Now think about that. I laid me down and slept, yet I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. I am not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on every side. Arise, O Lord. Rescue me, my God. Slap all my enemies in the face. Shatter the teeth of the wicked. Victory comes from you. And the NIV puts in a fourth, O oh Lord, that none of the other versions do. Um, may you bless your people. Selah. Think about that. Now, the Lord always honors the public reading of his word, and today is no different. Father, we ask you that you would um, just reveal your word to us, and may your Holy Spirit come and Make it real to us today. Speak, Lord, we say, for your sons and your daughters are listening. Dave reminded us last Lord's Day that there are five books of Psalms. They're split into five books up to chapter 42, I think it is, and on and on it goes. And um, the, uh, David wrote 73 um, of those Psalms, and um, many of them are actually songs or lyrics or poems inspired by the Lord. And the book of Psalms was essentially a hymnal for ancient Israel. It was something that they used to sing by and still used in many, many churches today. Courses and Psalms are sang. And um, part of what's make these lyrics um, so moving or so powerful is that they tug at our heartstrings. They're coming from real life interventions in the writers of these things, frequently reflecting the problems and pressures and the trying to live the way God wants us to live, even with all the heartache and, and mystery that is around that and all that we encounter along the way. And this psalm is no different. This psalm in particular, David identifies what I've um, discovered, four stages that a person will go through as they deal with sin or guilt or hardship, and um, or other words, how they deal with the consequences of life. 
And those four words, all beginning with D, you'll be glad to know, are despair, desire, dependence, and deliverance. And we're going to look at these four words just a few minutes each and look at how David experienced these um, things in his life. So let's start with despair. The background of the psalm is somewhat complicated, but it's important, so bear with me, all right? David's problems all began when he slept with a, a lady who wasn't his wife. He had loads of wives, but he saw Bathsheba take a bath on the rooftop when all his armies were out at war, and he should have been out there as well. But idle hands always find mischief. He saw this woman take a bath. He desired her, sent his uh, cohorts to get her, brought her home, and slept with her. And uh, she became pregnant. And that act of adultery led to an even more despicable act in David's past part, because in order to cover up the sin, he had Uriah, her husband, murdered, literally. Tried to cover it up and having time to go into the story today, most of you, I'm sure, will know bits and pieces of it, but eventually had him murdered, had him killed. And from this point onward, you will find in David's story that he had to live with the consequences of his sin. Even though he was a man after God's own heart, he was a man who knew how to get back into the presence of God quickly, as we'll see as we go through this uh, talk this morning. But uh, fast forward a few years, and you'll find one of David's sons called Amnon, and he got a little bit too enamored with his half-sister, Tamar. And unable to control his urges, he actually raped her. And uh, the story is found in 2 Samuel 13, if you want to read that. And of course, this enraged Tamar's full brother, who was called Absalom, and um, he sought revenge, bided his time, waited it out, and two years later, murdered Amnon, his half-brother. And, uh, and when David learned about both crimes, he, the rape and the murder, instead of dealing with it in a righteous way um, and in a just manner, he basically ignores the whole situation. It's the weirdest piece of scripture. And uh, you would wonder why he could do that, why he would let that go. Well, because David had committed basically the same crimes. And because he had committed the same crimes, he once lost his control of his urges, ended up killing an innocent man. So as a result, David had lost the moral authority to deal effectively with his sons. That's a really important word to fathers and mothers here today. He had lost the moral authority to deal effectively with his sons. And in time, Absalom became very defiant. He, uh, remember this, that appearance never uh, proves character. This is what was said of Absalom. No one was as famous as Absalom for his good looks. He had no defect head to toe. Beautiful hair, flowing hair, which was his downfall in the end. But he, he thought he was morally superior. He was a proud, arrogant man. And he thought he was a better, superior, and worthier leader than his father. So he would stand at the city gate. And when people would come um, to meet with, their fa with his father, David, he would say, my dad's far too busy for you. And I could sort it out quicker and easier for you anyway. And he won. The Bible tells us he won. He actually stole the hearts of the people. So if you ever hear of an Absalom spirit, that's what it does. It steals and wins the heart. And it was all built in ego. All right? And um, so... He mounted a rebellion, and in that rebellion, David was caught so much by surprise that he had to flee from the throne without actually putting his shoes on. It says he fled from the throne barefoot weeping. That's what it says about him. Hadn't even time to gather his clothes or his shoes. And it was in this context that David wrote Psalm 3. This is where this psalm comes from. And essentially, he brought all these problems on himself, and that's why he says the first of his O oh Lord, in this psalm, O oh Lord, so many are against me, even his own son. So many, so many seek to harm me. I have so many enemies. So many people are saying it's over for David. He's never going to make it. Absalom's going to wipe him out. This is it for him now. And uh, as I was working at this in the study this week, I was thinking of the Shame David must have felt being attacked and hunted down by his own son. How, how, how do you actually even tell somebody that? 
And David was reaping the consequences of bad choices that he's made. And this guy, who was once known as the man after God's own heart, David's life is now characterized at this moment by failure, by loneliness, by disappointment, and by agony. And when you think of his story, you think of the rejected son of Jesse out in the field whenever Samuel was there to anoint the new king. He was never thought of. This forgotten, rejected son of Jesse then becomes the errand boy, bringing the lunch to his brothers, then becomes the giant slayer, then becomes a soldier in Saul's army, then becomes the king of Israel. The anointing of God takes you up and up. That's what the anointing does. It takes you up and up. And yet now it tumbles like a house of cards. We can all sympathize because we've all made mistakes. We've all done it. We, we have done things that have come back to bite us or even haunt us. And um, even if the struggles you're facing aren't the result of your own bad decisions or failures or sins, you understand, I'm sure in some way, the despair that David felt. David was dealing with a rising tide of disloyalty and was about ready to give up. But remember this, that adversity has a way of defining you. Adversity has a way of molding and shaping you. Think of Goliath. He actually defined who David really was. Goliath's only purpose in life, the only purpose of Goliath's life was to make David great. And his life ended where his purpose ended. And some people and most people might never know who you are until you slay your giant. That's what made David great. Problems have a way of showing the enemy, who you really are. And David killed this giant with a rag and a rock. We know this story. And um, for Samuel 17, and with very little. And the proof of anointing is when you can do much with very little. Remember how Jesus fed 5,000 with a boy's lunch? The proof of anointing is when you can do much with little. And most of us, um, understand all too well what it's like to feel overwhelmed and hopeless as if everyone and everything is against you and it's easy to lose hope. Victor Frankl, who was um, interred in Auschwitz um, prisoner of war camp, said this, that the prisoner who has lost faith in their future is doomed. The prisoner who has lost faith in their future is doomed. That's how David felt. And if you're feeling like that right now, my word to you is don't despair. David as down and out as he was, believed in every fiber of his being that God was with him, which leads to the second stage in his adventure in approaching adversity, and that's desire. Hard-pressed by um, oppression, by opposition, by danger, David confesses his desire for intervention, crying out for help. He says in the second, O Lord, I love this, he says, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me. You're my glory and the one who holds my head high. The authorized calls him the lifter of your head. If your head is bowed down today, he is the lifter of your head. David's head may have been bowed low with shame, but he knew who could lift his head. He knew, the, uh, he knew out of the mess of his life, he knew where to turn. This is what made him a man after God's own heart. He knew his desire was to fix it quick. His desire was when a mistake came, he would keep short accounts with God and he would fix it quick. As a warrior, David was familiar with the protection of a shield against swords and arrows and enemies. And now his heart's desire and cry was that God would be his shield. And I, I, I love this. He says, I will pray. Look at all the, the present tense language. I will pray to the Lord and he will answer me. It's not like this is a sort of a, well, I'll try this and see if God answers. He said, I will pray. I will, uh, I will pray to the Lord. He will answer me from his holy mountain. Selah. Think about that. Pause and think about that. And if that's true for David, then it's true for you also. When your life is in shambles, when it feels like everything has fallen around about you, when you've messed up and you've got nowhere to turn, turn to Jesus. Turn to Yahweh. He's the one. Um, someone once said this, when life knocks you to your knees, well, that's the best position in which to pray. And when life knocks you down, you've got to look up. That's what he done. That's what, and you will hear, that's the promise of the Bible. And you'll see this right throughout the scripture, like verses like 1 John 5. Now, this is the confidence. What about that for a word? This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have uh, because of the petitions that we have asked of him. That's pretty amazing. God actually wants to answer our prayers. As long as the prayers doesn't contradict his purpose or his plan, then he's overjoyed to answer our requests. And the problem is that Christians, many Christians don't bother to ask. This is what James said. James said, you have not because you ask not. Or sometimes you're asking for the wrong motive because it's for selfish gain. The old brethren preachers used to say, stop using God like a lifeboat. Lifeboat is, you like to know what's there, but you never really want to use it. Or a fire escape. And, uh, and sometimes we say, well, I've tried everything else, so we better, we'll try and pray. And I, I, I find that sometimes when Christians say that, well, you know, the only thing we can really do for those people is pray. That's the best thing you can do for them. That's the greatest thing you can do. Fall on your knees and call out to pray, uh, pray for your friends because prayer ought to be part of the constant fellowship with God as we worship him. Don't worry or be anxious about anything and um, Paul writes to the church at Philippi, instead, pray about everything. Just don't pray about some things, not just big things, bad things or sad things, but everything. You can laugh at me for praying from a parking space if you want, but he answers every time, every time. And so we pray for everything. I love Martin Luther was a man of prayer, and his barber was a guy called, I've come in this story recently, and I loved it. His barber was a guy called Peter Beskendorf. And Peter Beskendorf was cutting Martin Luther's hair one day, and he asked him about prayer. And Martin Luther wrote him a 40-page letter about prayer. Now, here we go. We're going to quote. Only joking. Um, not going to read the 40 pages to you, but this is, this is a little piece out of the 40 pages, all right? Guard yourself against uh, such false and deceitful thoughts that keep whispering, wait a while, or in an hour or so I will pray. I must finish this or that, thinking such thoughts. We get away from prayer into other things that will hold us, involve us, till the prayer of the day comes to naught. It's a good thing to let prayer be the first business in the morning and the last in the evening. That's pretty good advice from a man who I think knew what he was talking about. And after expressing our desires through prayer, then the third stage is dependence. This is really important. As we encounter various trials in our life and feel that initial despair as David did, once we've expressed our desire for God to help, then we have to make sure that we, we can believe that God is in control and we can depend on him to take care of it. And I think this is where many of us fall down. Um, many of us have the tendency to lay our troubles at the feet of the Lord in the morning and by mid-afternoon we've taken them all up again and we're trying to work it out ourselves. And we're all guilty of it, all of us. David demonstrates this amazing surrender and dependence to God in this psalm. You've got to get this. He's barefoot. He's on the run. He's in the desert. He's been hunted by his own son, ready to usurp the throne. And yet after crying out to God for help, this is what he says. I laid down and slept. Once he'd done the business, he just thought, well, it's over to the Lord now. There's nothing more I can do. I lay down and slept. And he says, in peace and woke up safely, for the Lord was watching over me. And now alone 10,000 enemies surround me on every side. I'm not afraid. There ought to be a sailor there. It's not my job to tell the Holy Spirit what to do. But I think, I, well, I, that, that makes me pause and think. When I read that this week, I love that. This is fear. This is what it means to trust in God, to truly depend on him, to know that everything is going to work out, that you've led it all to him, no matter what the conflicts that are lying ahead. David didn't lose any sleep over it. Reminds me a little bit of Mark 4 when Jesus went to sleep on the pillow in the boat. It's the only reference in all of Scripture of Jesus going to sleep, by the way. But it's always intrigued me that um, this demonstration of faith uh, and trust which was not interrupted by what was going on around in the world. The, the boat has been tossed about in a storm. The water is getting into the boat. But Jesus just falls asleep because he knows his dependence is on God. And it demonstrates a level of faith and trust that's not going to be interrupted by worldly things. That's the kind of faith we need. Wouldn't you like to lay your head down tonight and fall asleep 
secure in the knowledge that God is in control and there's nothing to be afraid of, nothing to worry about, and nothing to lose sleep over. I, I love that, all right? That's the kind of trust and reliance that doesn't come naturally. That doesn't come easy. We have to learn how to let go. We need to learn how to let God take care of it. And this is the kind of lesson we can only learn through practice. You need to practice this. And as you look back over the life, I did that this week, look back over my life, even the bleakest moments. And I thought, you know, didn't God just work those things out in his time? Wasn't maybe by my calendar, wasn't the way I wanted it to be. But every time, every time he turns up, backs to the wire a few times, but he still turns up. And if you're in the middle of something now, you can trust that he will work it out too. I, I love this little saying of Tozer's. He said, with the goodness of God to desire our highest welfare, the wisdom of God to plan it, and the power of God to achieve it, what do we lack? We've got it all. And the enemy would like to make you think that living for God is a worthless struggle. Like Job said, I looked for him and I couldn't find him. There are times when God's counsel and purpose and direction are not clear in your life. I've been there. There's blind spots in life. There's no doubt about that. And once we've learned to depend on, on God to take care of us, then the final stage of triumphing um, over our enemies is that um, part we call deliverance. Beautiful. Finally, David brings everything into perspective. The marauding soldiers of his son, the lack of food and shelter, and even the throne of Israel meant nothing in light of God's infinite grace and power. And David announces his third, O Lord. He says, Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God. He said, For you have struck all my enemies in the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Now think about that. Isn't that pretty cool? The word translated victory or salvation in the Hebrew is the word ha Yeshua. And Yeshua in the Hebrew is the pronunciation of Jesus. So the word for victory, the word for salvation is Jesus. So quite literally, there's victory in Jesus. There's salvation in his name. David's imagery of knocking the teeth out of his enemies, slapping his enemies in the cheekbone, breaking, smashing their teeth reminds me of that passage that we uh, quote sometimes at gravesides, 1 Corinthians 15. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Humani humanity's greatest enemies are death and sin. And yet it tells us here that Jesus smashed the teeth out of them both. That's pretty cool. He smashed, he died on the cross. He knocked the teeth right out of them, both pulling their sting right out. Because of Jesus, we can have the final victory. Because of Jesus, there's nothing in this world that can push us back or hold us down because our deliverance and our victory is in him. It's not in our own skill. It's not in our, anything we can do. It's all in Jesus. And we've all made mistakes. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And most times we've had to live with the consequences of those sins and failures. But can I say this to you today? Failure is not the last word. Our problems are not the last word. Loneliness is not the last word. Guilt and shame are not the last words. Because salvation belongs to the Lord and there's victory in Jesus. Jesus is the last word. Jesus is the last word. And when we've got that, when, we, when sin rears its ugly head, when you've made a mess of your life, when you're living with the consequences, you might despair at first, then you express your desire for God's mercy and grace, you depend on him to see you through, and you trust that he will be your deliverer, your shield, your glory, and the lifter of your head. It's pretty cool, isn't it? That's Psalm 3. That's a pretty incredible psalm. We're going to sing in a minute or two, Marty and... Ella come up and lead us in a song as we close. But um, I'll tell you a story while they're getting ready um, to finish us off. Um, 
Most of you won't know who this is. Well, some of the older ones might. This is Tommy Dorsey. He was born in 1905. He was known as a jazz musician, and he probably one of the top um, trumpeters in the, in, in the world at one stage. He's known as the father of gospel music. He had enjoyed a career, a successful jazz musician, him and his brother Jimmy, Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey. <clears throat> After some time, he had surrendered his talents to the Lord. His life had been a bit of a mess, two or three breakdowns in relationships. And in 1931, he was just coming to the peak of his success and he had married again his new wife. They were overjoyed to learn that she was due to have a baby. And it was almost time for the baby to be born. And he had a living in Chicago. He had to go to another state to do a gig. And off he went. And that evening when he finished, he came down from the stage. And there was a telegram with only four words in it. Your wife is dead. He made a call home and... Um, all he could get from the other end of the phone, Natty is dead, Natty is dead. And he got back, he learned that Natty was, you know, had given birth to a boy. And while he swung between grief and joy, that night the little baby boy died as well. And Tommy Dorsey buried Natty and their little boy together in the same coffin. And then sort of life fell apart for him. And uh, for days he locked himself away, felt that God had done an injustice to him and didn't want to serve God anymore, write any more gospel songs, just wanted to go back to the jazz world that he knew so well. Some Christian friends ministered to him. Not long afterwards, he, and I'm going to quote this, he said, something happened to me. He said, I sat down at the piano and I felt a peace as though I could reach out and touch God um, personally. And as he played this melody, he started to write some lyrics and he wrote this little Phrase that some of us will know, precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Dorsey later wrote, and I quote, I learned that when we're in our deepest grief, and when we feel furthest from God, that's when he's the closest and that's when we're most open to his restoring power. If you're in the middle of something right now, because life throws curveballs at us, and you've all lived long enough to know that, don't despair. While we sing, um, try to regain a confidence in God, can you? Try to regain a confidence in God that you can do what David done with his dependence, his despair, and, and taking it, uh, having that desire for God to take that off you, get into a dependence mode where we can uh, just say, God, you've done it before, you can do it again. God, looking back in my life, you've done it so many times, you can do it again. God, would you deliver me right now out of the hand of the enemy? Would you come and slap them in the teeth, as it were, and break every bond of the enemy? So I... Uh, my mom used to say her favorite little line in the Bible was, and I've told you this many times, it came to pass. And I remember well on the, Jill died late on the Wednesday night and around midnight on the Wednesday night and the Thursday was a dark day. I don't remember much about the Thursday, but on Friday morning at five o'clock in the morning, it was a really wet morning. I wasn't sleeping and I thought, I'll go to mom's. And I drove the six or seven miles down to my mum's at five, quarter to five in the morning. And of course, when I got there, her kitchen light was on. The back door was open. I opened the door. She had the teapot on. She says to me, I was expecting you, son. And we sat down and had a cup of tea. And she said these words to me. She says, son, I know at this moment in time, it's the blackest of black. But she said, it'll come and it'll pass came to pass everything in this life comes and it will pass and that little phrase caught me in the Bible and I did a little exercise on it it's 396 times in the Bible 396 times so that makes it important to me it came to pass can I say to you your pain won't last forever 
whatever you're going through at the moment, whatever your family's going through, whatever crisis is in you, it won't last forever. The terrible circumstances that you may be in are known by God and they're being attended to by God. So Father, I pray right now as we come to close that you would minister to us even as we worship right now. Lord, we know that there's a ministry in worship. And so we ask you just as Marty and Ella close us off here, God, that you will minister to us through this song, that we'll find you in the middle of whatever's going on in our lives. In Jesus' name. I'll come back and close us off in a moment. Thanks, Marty.